we can we can tie this in with with um, number mysticism mm. through. Uh, well, you can. <laughs> yeah. um, twelve and the numbers twelve and thirteen. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Which, you know, it, from a strictly mathematical point of view, twelve is is you know divisible by two and three, and thirteen's uh, a prime number, and you can say various things about them, but. Uh, from a, a, a numerological or, or number mystical point of view, which isn't something I'm promoting, it's just I'm, I'm aware that mm. people in various ancient cultures and, and certain sort of modern subcultures adhere to these ideas. And, uh, well, the, first of all, if you look at the, the tarot, the, uh, the major arcana in the tarot, the sun is number 12 and the moon is number 13. And, uh, represent the sides of a Pythagorean triangle. Um, so a triangle that's got uh, a, a right angle with sides 12 and 5 will have a sloping side or hypotenuse which is 13 and that's highly unusual among right angled triangles when you have a whole number on both sides. Yeah. The, the diagonal is very rarely yeah. going to be a whole number. It is a mathematical formula which many people learn in school, which relates those. Um, but it, it turns out that if you if you split the five side into two and three and then take a, a, a line from the, the in-between point, so you've got the short side of the triangle, the long side of the triangle, the short side's five, you split it into three plus two, yeah. and then you take uh, a line. Um, so you've got something which is longer than the 12, but yeah. shorter than the 13. Yeah. And it's it's twelve point three six nine roughly. Uh -huh. It's the square root of one hundred and fifty three, which is that number that shows up in the Gospel of which is it? The Gospel of John. And you, in, in, when Jesus gets his disciples to put the net on the other side of the boat and they catch one hundred and fifty three fish, and no one really knows why it was that number. It, it, coincidentally, if you take the square root of that number, you get the length of that piece of line. Okay. And that piece of line, uh, well, that length, 12.369 dot dot dot, is very, very close to the number of lunar um, cycle. Sorry, the number of, yeah, the number of lunar cycles in a solar year. Yeah. Because this is the problem of trying to get the sun and the moon to fit together. They yeah. don't fit together neatly. Yeah. Um, you know, there's 12 months in a year, we know exactly, but a month, what's a month? You know, that keeps changing, well, and then there's leap years. And yeah, it's all, it's a mess, basically. You know, some months are 28 days, some are 31. You know, Roman emperors have stuck their own months yeah. in, and people have messed with this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, but how many actual lunar cycles are there in a year? Well, it turns out there's um, 12.369 something, which is very, very close to the square root of 153, which is this line on this triangle, this 5, 12, 13 triangle. And Stonehenge, which you can very easily um, use uh, to, to predict solar eclipses, um, it's not some mystical belief, mm. some new age belief that you can do that. There are holes in the tops of the stones and I think they're called Aubrey holes. I might have right. got this wrong. Um, and there's a simple technique where you can just move pegs around the holes where you move, I don't know, one peg you move one, one hole a day and the other peg you move two holes a day in the other direction or something. And, that measures. and when they cross over, you get, um, you, you can, you can, basically predict solar eclipses through the um, coincidence of these cycles. Wow. Uh, and there's, a, there's alignments, Stonehenge with summer solstice sunrises, we all know about that. Mm. Um, but also the layout of Stonehenge involves a 5 by 12 rectangle in terms of the, the original um, earthen bank and ditch henge long before the big stones went up is all uh, is set within a 5 by 12 rectangle marked by four what we call sentinel stones, which are just little mm. things that nobody notices anymore. Yeah. So these are all out from the main stone circle. Yeah, yeah. But basically the whole thing's a giant 5 by 12 rectangle, so the diagonal across that is 13. Yeah. So Stonehenge is just going 5, 12, 13, <laughs> 5, 12, 13, everyone. 
Um, and it's an attempt to, I think, Stonehenge was an attempt to somehow marry the solar and lunar cycles. And that isn't, that isn't just a functional, oh, we need to know when to plant our crops, kind of, you know, oh, it's just a calculator to help the agricultural, um, you yeah, know, for some sort of agricultural purpose. I think it was more of a, a, a magical act or a ritual act of trying to marry the solar and lunar cycles perhaps at a time when the solar and lunar modes of consciousness were needing to be um, somehow rebalanced or fused, or maybe it was an experiment that went wrong, maybe this is the beginning of, of some sort of transition. It's, it's also, I mean, very, ev you know, a real evidence of sort of our need to measure things. Mm. You know, we have this, we have anything that we see that marks time, we sort of grasp onto. As, as some way of sort of measuring something, divi dividing s the, which, this sort of eternal length of infinity of mm. time, of light, whatever, that goes beyond you. You want to sort of like, it's like getting a handle on something. Because we do that, or our culture yeah, does that. Yeah. So we, when we see anything anyone else has done, we, we sort of project that notion onto it. That Maybe. Yeah. Mm. Um. I remember reading um, a book called Johnny Got His Gun and it was written by one of the men who was like the original 10 blacklisted Hollywood or you know the Holly was it the Hollywood 10 or something like that what, in what the McCarthy oh, right, for, McCarthy era for being for big, communist, potentially communist. Yeah. Um, and this guy was it's, I think is something Trumbo Donald or Dalton but yeah it's about this person who this soldier who loses Basically, he's just a head and a torso, like a torso. He has no, like almost all, and he's completely bandaged up and he has like no eyes and no mouth. And okay. I mean, it's a real like, you know, it's like barely to look at. You would think that's not a living human, mm -hmm. but he, you know, it's all set in his mind. Wow. And uh, it's an amazing book, actually. And it's just, you would think, how could you write a whole novel about someone who can't interact mm. with his world, can't do anything, can't go anywhere, can't speak, you know, like how, what could this novel be? Mm. And it really is amazing. And part, parts of it is him sort of, it, it's all about sort of him trying to do the things that we all do with what he has. But because he's, what he has is so limited, the author's really exploring these sort of essential things that we do as conscious beings, okay. one of which is keeping time. Right. So like the first thing he does to keep himself from going absolutely insane is, you know, the frequency that the nurse comes in and then sort of, you know, when his, when different parts of him get washed or changed, he can tell that there's this routine that's happening uh -huh. and he starts sort of deciphering that well, if this happens every so often, maybe this is a day. Right. So it's almost and like recapitulating is... ancient people, seeing the yeah. movements of the planets and working out. And he's out. so limited yeah. in sight, so he's going on what happens in this room yeah. to do with him. Oh. But before you were saying about um, this, this humans kind of cutting up time and yeah. measuring, and I thought you were specifically talking about the sort of modern Western tendency to No, do no, that. I meant those guys back then. Right. So, <laughs> so there were deeper human need to, mm. to find temporal cycles. Yeah, or like, you know, the sticks that have been used for counting is like one of the first sort of counting mechanisms. Is it you that you... Did the, I learn the, that from the, you? Well, there's the Ashango bone, which has uh, got marks on it, which seem to have been counting lunar cycles. Yeah, even that, you know, what... Or was it? Is that something else? That was No, that was the one with prime numbers on it, the Ashango bone. Oh, right. Um, but there, there, there are very early yeah. tally, tally stones and things which appear to have been some sort of timekeeping. Um, but then there may have been long, long periods before that where humans just were, weren't were doing it. Yeah. Well, that, but I think that is interesting because mm. it feels like there obviously was a point where it changed. Well, we fell into this idea of time and we're falling more mm. and more into an idea of linear time now where it's yeah. like very precisely chopped up. We have nuclear clocks mm. now, atomic mm. clocks that measure time to billionths of a second. Um, time it used to be a lot more fluid, even in the early part of the 20th century, you mm. know, where railway timetables all had to be standardised because different ta towns around right, the country yeah. would have their clocks slightly differently. Yeah. And it's just all getting tightened up. And I think if you go There's back far enough... There's an amazing book by James Glick called Fast... Well, it's Fister. It's right. Faster, but out James Glick. Right, well, yeah, um, and... Uh, and that, 
James Gleek, who wrote the Gleek? Chaos book. Is it Gleek or Gleek? I don't know. Yeah, G-L-E-I-C-K, I'll put yeah. it up. But it is this anyway. idea that you start by measuring these sort of quite big, but as you sort of, the, the intervals at which you're sort of, that you're uncovering, that you're mm. well, uncovering, the intervals that, that you're measuring therefore makes time go feel faster because, because you're measuring you're always closer to the next sort of ah right yeah if you're just seeing time in terms of days or, or seasons or even or, yeah, yeah seasons or i don't know generations even you know yeah, it's just it's going to move more slowly in a way and we're just we're so everyone, aware of seconds and everyone can feel this acceleration everyone mm. feels to be under this pressure to kind of keep moving keep getting yeah. things done it's a strange sort of disease which is just kind of affecting everyone and everything and everyone just sort of goes mm, shrugs their shoulders about it and complains to each other but what is happening why is this going on there's been attempts to analyze it and uh, these books might be a good starting point um but it, it may have, this process may have begun a very long time ago yeah you know, and we're just kind of hurtling into the center well, of I the spiral i think that's sort of what what i think yeah it was just yeah so <laughs> i think that's what i think it's not something maybe that's <clears throat> built into human existence but it's something that maybe thousands of years ago some flip occurred yeah. in terms of our relationship with reality and so and that yeah, this would just inevitably start yeah we're sort of spiraling in on this kind of ever accelerating um hurtling towards something but i mean i don't know how much how, how much faster do, can things get before well, it all just serious, shakes itself it? apart? Because people in, you know, mm. earlier generations seeing people now, modern Western people, would be alarmed at the pace of life. And but at the same time, people mm. spend eight hours a day playing video games. <laughs>